Hello, welcome back. Uh, today we're taking our study of these endpoint ring functions uh, in a non-perturbative way one step further. And we'll be able to prove a very important uh, reduction formula for quantum field theory, which is the LSZ reduction formula. So if you notice, if you paid uh, close attention, you might have noticed that so far we have looked at these uh, green functions with some number of external legs, right? And we did um, worry about what happens when some internal momenta or combination of momenta uh, go uh, on shell, right? When you go through some uh, mass of some resonance, right? But we didn't worry uh, about these external uh, legs for this diagram, right? We didn't say anything about them. So in principle, these momentum, these momenta, could be anything. They could be uh, on shell or off shell. Yeah. This is very useful because um, so far most of what we, uh, everything we conclude so far, also applies to sub diagrams. We know that for any physical process, these external legs will eventually have to be taken on shell, right? But not, that's not true if this diagram is inside some bigger uh, diagram, right? And by keeping these momenta uh, um, generic, right, on shell or off shell, uh, uh, we, we kept our conclusions valid, even if we're talking about parts of, of, of bigger diagrams, right? Now, what we want to do is actually worry about full, full green functions and starting putting those uh, external legs on shell. Right? So we'll consider uh, an endpoint green function. Again, I keep I'm keeping uh, uh, to to uh, scalar fields uh, so far, right? But again, those things are mo mostly uh, easily generalizable to more complicated fields, as long as you know how they transform under Lorentz transformations. Right? And I'll take one of these fields and treat it separately from the other. So I'll take the Fourier transform of just one of them and calculate this. So I'm associating a momenta P, momentum P with position X, right? And to make it uh, explicit, I'll name one of the positions just X which is the one I'm doing the Fourier transform on, right? and call all the other positions uh, Z1 all the way to Y of Z n plus 1. I'll call n plus 1 for now, because eventually I want to take two legs to be the initial incoming legs and n final legs. So, uh, that's just a notation. I could call this n, n plus one, I, I don't care, right? The thing is, I'm looking at a, arbit a, 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 a green function with an arbitrary number of um, uh, coordinates, and I'm doing the Fourier transform in one of them. Well, now I can look at this integral in x here, especially the time part of this integral which is the integral of x naught, right? And divide uh, this integral into, into three distinct regions, which I'll name. F the first one will be the integral from some time, which I'll call t plus to infinity, right? Since this is from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? dx naught. A second intermediate uh, reason that go, region that goes from t minus to t plus. And a third one that goes from minus infinity to t minus. And the defining um, uh, relation that defines these three regions, which I'll name 
region one region two and two and region three right, will be uh, the condition that t plus is bigger than all the other times uh, present here for the coordinate z right and t minus is smaller than all these times with that condition in place i'm in a position that i can simplify this time ordering right at least in regions one and three right so in region one i can clearly remove phi x to the left of the time ordering because it's all the, its time is always bigger than all the others and on region three i can move it to the right so let's start by focusing on region uh, one, right? So I'm, I'm just taking this expression in when this uh, integral is limited to this region. So what I'll have is just the time integral here, right? I still have the integral over the three other uh, co x coordinates, right? D3x. And I, I will separate the exponential two and this is the vector, the three vector part of the exponential. Okay? And then of course I can move this phi outside the time ordering. And here I ha still have the time ordering for the z coordinates. by z n plus one omega now now that i have separated phi of x from the rest right i'll use all the tricks we have been using so far let me move this up right and again i'll insert here that identity uh, with all the states uh, right so i'll rewrite here this term by inserting that uh, identity the sum or integral over lambda right again i'm thinking of a complete set of states uh, eigenstates of momentum and, and energy right so d3k over 2 pi cubed 2 E, K, lambda, right? And all of these will just become omega, phi of x. And here comes the completeness, the part that is summed over. So lambda K, lambda K, right? Is the identity inserted here. And then you have this, this whole thing that goes over here. Right? And also, I'll use the same tricks. Now they are getting old already for rewriting this guy in terms of omega phi of zero, lambda zero, exponential of minus i k x, where k zero here, I'm not integrating in k is not right k naught is just e k lambda right so the tricks uh, from the tick the tricks that allow you to get from here to here is the, the translation right you just use the translation operator and then you do a boost to bring these eigenstate of momentum to its rest frame so eigenstate of momentum zero right and remember when i use this boost uh, I have to know how this guy transforms under boosts. So this is the very simplest case, which is a scalar. But if it was not a scalar, you have some matrix here for the representation of how this guy transforms under boosts. Right? So now, since I have the scalar, this is as simple as that. And I have to put everything in green here up on this expression. Right, let's do that. Let me copy 
everything that is just uh, repeated right here. And now let's uh, bring everything together. And I had to squeeze things a little bit here because our computer screens are just not big enough for quantum field theory. But you can see, you can follow the colors here, right? I just repeated the sparking white. I brought all these in green right here, replacing the matrix element by this part, where I separated the uh, space part from the time, by right? the, the position from time here, because now looking at this, I can see a easy to do integral, right? If I, I take uh, these, uh, three pos uh, uh, coordinate integral together with these exponential and this one right this is the only dependencies on, on on x right and i can write these as the direct delta right to pi to the cube delta 3 k minus Right, this is just uh, the direct delta, which then, of course, I can use to do this integral. So this uh, 2 pi to the cube goes away, and I can do the, the integral in k, and rewrite this expression right, in a much more simple form. Right, so let me just rewrite everything again, because now I have my space, the integral in time, x naught, I did this one, I did this one. Now I have this exponential together with this one, but k, since I did the integral in k, I can replace k for p here. So it's just the exponential of minus i ep from here, minus p0 from here, x naught. Right, which appears in both. And then I just repeat this part. Making it a little bit more readable now that I have space. And there's also a missing uh, two E. Again, I can exchange K for P, right, by P and so there's a 2 EP of lambda down here. Now I want to do the x naught integral. I want to do the integral in time. Of course, in the upper limit, this integral is very badly behaved, right? It's oscillating, oscillating wildly when I go to a very big x naught. So I have to regularize this somehow. And we know that for positive time the way to do that is just put a minus epsilon x naught right here right? that makes the integral uh converge for 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 big times okay? and allows us uh to do the integral so we can write the answer here just copy this part and that one over two e p of lambda Right? And the, the integral itself will give me an i exponential of minus i e p minus e naught t plus minus epsilon t plus over p naught minus e p of lambda plus i epsilon and of course i just re repeat all of these i just repeat all of these now, uh, I want to focus again, same thing I did with the spectral representation, right? I want to focus for a little bit in the region when I have the lowest lying pole 
of the theory, right? I just go for the region where I have lambda equal to one, assuming, of course, there's um, a uh, one particle state, there is low in lying, lowest lying state of the theory is just a one particle pole, right? And this, this region will be dominated by lambda 1, and, and the mass of this state, I assume, is uh, we you call it m1, but I'll just simplify to f. Right? So, in general, this function has a complicated uh, analytical structure. Right? It can be poles in p0 when p0 is equal to ep. Right? But if they, those are poles or branch cuts, depends if on if I mean the region where ep varies discreetly and I can replace this by a sum or when I can I, I, I actually be forced to integrate over lambda because there are uh, uh, the energy varies continuously as a function of lambda. Near this pole this is simpler right it's just one isolated pole right and I'll focus on that. The exponential up here basically goes away Right, because this epsilon I can take to zero on this exponential I already did its job, right, of uh, dealing with bigger uh, x naught, right. And this part, of course, it's when I go near the pole, these two are the same, so this is zero and the exponential is one. The denominator here can also be rewritten in a much more useful form near the pole, right, to see that. Rem remember that I can write p square minus m square, now the four momentum, right, as p zero square minus p vector square minus m square, which in turn, right, can be, uh, I can group these two, this is just p zero square minus e p square for that mass, right, I remember I'm just thinking of m here, Right, which is the mass of the lowest lying resonance, and these, of course, can be write, written as p zero plus e p p zero minus e p. And if I'm concentrating on the region near this pole, where p zero is going to e p, right? Uh, uh, you see that p square minus m square is equal to 2 ep, right? because these two are the same. Right? And this I have to keep because it's the leading uh, contribution on p0 minus ep. Mm -hmm. So I can rewrite what I have here. Right? I have 2 ep times p0 minus ep as p square minus m square. Of course, I have another term here that there is these uh, 2 ep times i epsilon. I can call this just epsilon prime, right? It's still a small positive number, but I'll call it just epsilon, right? That means that near the pole, now I want to write the full ring function, right? So d the thing we were calculating from the start, right? I P X Omega T Phi X Phi Z one up to Phi of Z N plus one. Which I ha what I have shown that is that uh in one of the regions, right, which is when I'm going near this pole, is just for p not going to e p. This is just i over e square minus m square plus i epsilon, which is just me rewriting this part. So here's the i, and this is just rewritten as p square minus m square times the square root of z. Again, I'm defining this as I did before, right? As the transition between the vacuum and the state with one uh, particle with uh, momentum zero, 
right? Which comes from here in the case where lambda is just the first uh, one particle state, right? Also, I have this lambda p here that when I specialize for the one particle state will be just the, I, uh, the state with one particle with momentum p, right? Which shows up here. And then I have the rest of the time ordering phi of z1, phi of zn plus 1. So it's, it's very important to understand what I'm saying here, right? This is not actually an equal, right? This is just near this particular pole, right? Of course, if I try to write the whole expression, there'll be other terms here which I'm assuming are finite near this pole. So, for instance, I'm including here all the other terms in the sum of lambda, right? They have poles in different regions, but on that uh, uh, lowest lying pole, they are, they are just analytic, right? Also, I'm assuming that in the integral in regions 2 and 3, remember, I did just this calculation for region 1. I'm assuming uh, for now that regions 2 and 3 do not generate poles here, right? So, of course, near this pole, this is what dominates, right? I have to show, it specifically for regions 2 and 3, that they do not generate poles uh, right here. Right, the lambda part is easy. I have shown that before, right? You have that structure with the lowest lying poles. Eventually, you also have a continuum. Region three is easy, right? I, I won't do everything again. I just have to follow the same uh, procedure I followed this far, right? So, region three. There will be a few changes of signs because now phi one will come to the right side here. So when I do uh, the boosts and translations, I'll apply the, especially the translation operator to a momentum on the left. So there'll be a change in the sign of the exponential. But since I'm keeping the one here, right? They will, this will be compensated by a change in the energy. So what, what I'll get from region three is that function. You can do that yourselves and check, right? Uh, it's exactly the same calculation, I have to be careful with the signs, is that there will be a pole instead in minus EP. That may seem a little bit strange because I'm saying the energy goes negative, but it's actually because I have the wrong sign in the exponential, right? For, for a state that now is an incoming state instead of outgoing state. Right? And this is compensated by the sign in energy, right? But the rest of the expression looks very similar. So this is p square minus m square plus i epsilon. I, again, I have a square root of z. And this is changed, is now omega t. Same time ordering, z1 until phi of z n plus 1. And again, I will indicate this as minus a three momenta p because the sign of the exponential is not the right convention I have been using for incoming states. So this is an incoming state with momentum minus p, right? Uh, but that shows that these, the region three actually also produces a pole, but it is in a different place than the pole from region one. So one of these regions will not produce a pole in the same place that the other region does. Region 2 is even simpler because now both ends of the, both limits on the time integral will contribute, right? You don't have minus infinity uh, or plus infinity, right? And if you follow the same uh, uh, procedure we have been using here, you eventually get to an integral that looks like uh, this, p naught minus e k plus p plus 
EK, uh, EK, right? And this has no poles, either on one energy or the other, right? You can choose, uh, uh, you, can, you can try to find poles, and this is actually analytic in both, for both regions, the plus energy region and the minus energy region. So it does not contribute to any poles. Huh? What I would like to do now is do the same for the other uh, field operators here. Right? So instead of just pulling one of these external momenta and putting it on shell, I would like to put them all on shell. But that demands extra care, right? Because during this derivation, at some point I focused on the one particle state, right? Uh, on all the sum of all uh, on the sum of all the eigenvectors of energy and momentum. I focused on the one particle state. And now I'll have many of these particles and I have to be careful to differentiate something that is uh, just a bunch of one particle states completely independent from each other, right? From a very complicated state where all these uh, particles are interacting amongst themselves, right? I want to avoid that. And in order to do that, I have to be more careful about the localization of these particles because I have uh, to be able to say that in some sense they are far apart so I can treat each of these outgoing momenta as, uh, uh, as uh, pertaining to one independent free particle, right? At least that's symptotically free. And again, Free here means a free particle from an interacting theory. I'm not going to the free theory, right? So let's see how I can do that, right? The first step would be to not do this uh, Fourier transform that I did right at the very start, right? If I want these asymptotic states to be uh, fairly, uh, um, uh, have momentum that is fairly well-defined, but, but at the same time, I don't want plane waves. I have to do something different here, right? And exchange what I, I did with the Fourier transform by a fairly narrow distribution around uh, uh, momentum, right? Around a well-defined uh, momentum. So I exchange this Fourier transform I did up here by something that looks like that. So I have now an integral in momentum, in three momentum, right? I still have d4x, and this remains unchanged, right? But this uh, plane wave here is replaced by the exponential of minus i k x sigma of k, which is supposed to be a, a narrow distribution on k but not at, at Dirac delta right of course i can go back by taking this equal to the delta right uh, of k minus p right just if i do this i go back to what i was doing before but now i just taking a narrow but not too narrow distribution right and, it, and of course, this distribution is also centered around P. Let's see how that changes uh, um, what we have done before. The main difference happens right here, right? So instead of having an expression uh, like this one, right, near the pole, now we'll have a distribution, right? Instead of a, a, a just an energy EP, now we have a distribution that will look like this, right? So we'll have the sum over lambdas, right? This integral over this d3k right here, over 2 pi to the cube. The distribution in momentum k centered around p, right? And 1 over 2 ek lambda times i p0 mi minus e k lambda plus 
i epsilon so that exponential is already gone because near the pole i i can approximately ignore the exponential right but now i have this uh, k ek here right and of course also the brackets let me write them here and the zero times lambda k t phi z1 until phi z n plus 1 right which near the pole right will behave like so again when p0 goes near ep right there will be now an integral in the 3k 2 pi cubed i phi of k right? very similar to before but now i have this p tilde which i'll define next minus m square plus i epsilon square root of z so what i'm doing here is specializing for the for the first guy in the sum of lambda right k t phi z1 phi of z n plus 1 omega which is a little bit more general than what we had before right and uh also i need to define p tilde p tilde is just p zero k right and of course again the uh, this all goes back to the previous result if i take uh, this function to be just a delta of k minus p what happened here is that now instead of you having just a, a pole uh, for a, a number, right, a specific, a specific value of p0, right, now you have a, just a small branch cut, right, because uh, now the energy is, is scanning, right, the, the, the three momenta is scanning a small window with uh with around the width of this function k here right so ek can assume a, some some values around uh p right so you have a small branch cut that goes back to being a pole if you take these narrower and narrower now okay this so good so far right now we want to do that for all the lines Right? And I have to rethink that division in terms of uh, regions in time. So let's do that. Right? The first thing is I just write the same kind of Fourier transform for every variable. So now I'm doing that for everyone from E equal 1 to N plus 2. And that's YN plus 2 because now I'm not calling x separate from z so I included x back here right and i'm thinking about these brackets phi of x1 and you have this product until phi of x n plus 2. so like at the start i have a total of n plus 2 external lines right but now they are all called x and here is the uh, finite with Fourier transform. So I have a D3 of Ki, right? This product is over I. 2 pi cube D4 xi exponential of I P to the I xi defined each of the pi are def is, is defined like that right you have 
also n plus 2 functions like that. I assume all of them to be equally narrow. No reason to even make them different. Right? And of course, this goes right here. Right? So this is what I'm trying to calculate now. Instead of just going to momentum space, I'm, I'm doing this uh, kind of transform. Right? And now I have to, for each of the um, x, i, zeros, right? I have to do that uh, that uh, division in regions 1, 2, and 3, right? With the extra assumption now, what I'll, I'll, I'll say now, that is, I'll also define a t minus and a t plus, right? I'll put the origin of my time around the center here. This will be region 2, region 1, and region 3, as before. But now, every time I do one, the one of the lines, I'll assume the same things I assumed before. But now, also, I assume that in region 1 and region 3, right? This, uh, uh, this state is isolated from all the others, too, right? And let's see, uh, of course, that is allowed by the fact that now I have a distribution around position. They are not completely delocalized. You just have to take the Fourier transform of this function, right? And let's see what kind of consequence that uh, has. What I want to do next is now think of the many possible time orderings here, right? So, of course, I can uh, take this matrix element. And there will be cases where I can separate this time ordering like this. Phi of x1, phi of x2 times the ordering from x3 onwards, right? all the way to x n plus 2, because that's one of the possibilities. That's the case where these two times happen in region 1, and these this, this, uh, others one are in region 3, for instance. Right? Uh, but also I could put an extra field here, have 3 and, and n minus 1 on the other side, and so on and so forth. Right? Let's start with the simplest case, which is exactly this one, the one where I taking two of these fields uh, uh, to be happening later, right? Two of these times to be later than the rest of them, and see what happens. And then you'll see that uh, the conclusions I can uh, get to for two and n. Are, are easily to generalize for 3 and n minus 1, 4 and n minus 2, and so on. Right? So what I want to do next is, again, same trick as always. Right? So identity, the usual identity goes here with the uh, complete set of states, and uh, I do my manipulations from that point forward. Right? So now I'm assuming, just for to leave everything explicit here, I'm assuming x1 not and x2 not to be in region 1. Right? And see what happens. So uh, what I'll get is the sum over lambda, sum or integral over lambda. Again, I have this uh, momentum integral here, 1 over, this is just a normalization, right? And then I'll have a product phi i 1 2 of the integral in d3 k i over 2 Phi cubed 
d4 is i exponential of i d tilde i x i phi i k i right so i called now the the momentum that i used for the completeness relation these uh, capital k here right so then i have these times the two matrix elements here that i obtained there which are omega t of just the two times i separated x1 right of x2 lambda k right big k is the momentum for the completeness relation lambda k and then the time ordering of the rest of the field operators for all the other positions x3 x n plus 2. right and here's the point where these um, wave packet that i'm constructing becomes important right because i have to make some assumption about these guys right here or i cannot go much farther with my calculation right what i you was i will assume is that if these uh, uh guys are sufficiently localized in position space that i can write this guy as a product of just the one particle with some momenta k1 and another one particle state with some momenta k2 right in that case i can rewrite this expression right as the sum over lambda 1 lambda 2 right so now i have two independent indexes that take care of the two particles that i have here right the integral this integral appears twice d3 k1 2 pi cube 1 over 2 e of k1 same thing for k2 And also this matrix element will separate into omega phi 1, x1, lambda k1, times omega phi 1, x2, lambda k2. So essentially I'm assuming that this Hilbert space factorizes into two different Hilbert spaces where one, one uh, where phi of x1 acts, another one where phi of x2 acts. Right? And then this, this part I leave uh, essentially untouched. I'll just put a label to remember that the states I'm considering are two particle states, but two independent particle states that I'm considering here. And everything else is just the same. So that's the main assumption I'm making here, right? that I can actually do the separation. And you can see that if this is true for two particle states, right? The same could be assumed or three particle states, four particle states. So this separation that I just did here could be done with three and four or five fields, right? So the, it's not more drastic to assume that for a number of, of, of fields than it is to assume for just two of them, right? So this is always the same, right? Now I can do, right? Everything from this point on will be very similar to what I had before. I think I forgot a bunch of stuff here. Yeah, I, 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 I'm still missing that part, right? Should be here. But now I can put that back in and uh, 
do the same I did before because this uh, part and this part have effectively become independent. So I'm, I'm just doing the same calculation I did before twice. So the conclusion would be that this guy, which is what I'm calculating now, behaves near the pole as, so in this case, I, I did just two of these particles going near the pole. So P1 is going next to E of K1. Uh, actually P1, because the distribution is centered around P1. And P2, 0 is going next to P2. These will behave like these states. And you have the distributions, pi i, k i, i, square root of z, p i tilde square minus m square plus i epsilon. And then you have this part, right? Now we specialize for the one particle. So both of these sums over lambda are now being taken just the first contribution, right? The uh, lowest lying one particle state, which is K1, K2, pi of X3, pi of x n plus 2. And of course I'm talking about always the lowest lying one particle state just because it's simpler, but it could be any one particle state, right? as long as we're going to the pole, a well-defined pole of some, some bound state, for instance. Okay? So this uh, um, is uh, the result. Now we can take the limit back to, to uh, narrow distributions. Now I can make a choice of phi right? and specialize this for a very narrow state. Of course, I go uh, back to these, right? This, so these integrals go away. I stay with this, which now becomes just pi and in that limit right these two guys are the out states because now i have the same time i make these guys narrower and narrower i also have to think asymptotically right and and so these guys are just the out states p1 and p2 Now I can do the same for this uh, product right here, right? Put all of these times in the distant past, so region three, right? And assume again that I can factorize these asymptotic states into one particle states. Same thing I did here, and I'll get the same kind of conclusion, right? It's, it's very similar. So what I'll get from that is that if I take the pole where P1 and P2, which are the outgoing states here, are going to E of P12, right? Let's call PI. Okay. And, and at the same time, the other momenta, like P3 and the rest of them, right, which are the ingoing states, are going to minus E PI, where I here goes from 3 to N plus 2, right? This function will behave like complete propagators. Right? Remember, this is how we have uh, concluded in the previous uh, two videos that the uh, one particle full propagator for, for the full interacting theory behaves near a one particle pole. Right? 
So what we have here is the full propagator for each of these states. Times, right? this does not change. And what happens on this side is the same. Right? I have this minus P3, minus P4, etc. Right? I go to minus P n plus 2. And again, just to remind you, well, there's no time ordering anymore. Just to remind you, these minuses here is just because when I'm taking the Fourier transform, I'm using the same sign on the exponential for incoming and outgoing states. And that's not our usual convention, right? The, the ingoing states, we use a minus sign here in the exponential. And when I, I move to that convention, then I can remove these minuses from here, right? But uh, that does not change the interpretation. Right? So what I'm finding here, also there's no omega here. Uh, so what I'm finding here, in, so the conclusion is that I got a S matrix element, right? This is the S matrix element, time these full propagators. And here's the summary of what we did. So we started from this function and we wanted to move to momentum space. But instead of just doing a Fourier transform, we assumed that the incoming and the outgoing states are actually uh, finite with states both in momentum and in, in position, right? So we built like a, something like a wave packet. Right? Then we looked at the dominant terms near these uh, poles. Poles here is under, under um, quotes. Because it's not, it's not really a pole in the case that this is a wave pack. It's just a small branch cut, but uh, you get the drift. We're looking at the, the terms that are dominant in that region, right? And then we get to this expression written in terms of fairly well-defined momentum states, right? And then we make these states narrow, right? And we get to expression that is just the S matrix, the scattering matrix, time the full propagator for each of these incoming or outgoing states. In the case we did was two incoming states and and, and, and outgoing ones, right? Uh, but the tricky part here is to, there are two limits involved here. One where you look near the pole, right? For this dominant term, so you're taking at the momenta near the, the, their poles. And another limit which is making these guys narrow, right? And you have to be able to show that the order in which you take these two limits does not matter, at least for the leading uh, contributions near the poles, right? This is what has been shown in the original LSZ paper, actually. It goes along the, along the lines of uh, the question you could ask yourself here is take these two positions that I, I, I used at start, right? X1 and X2, right? It might be that for, uh, in the asymptotic future, the, the position of one of these states gets closer to the other. Right? In that case, the exponential that I would be talking about when I do all the calculations I, I did would look something like this, P1 minus P2 or plus P2, it doesn't matter, X1. Right? And in that case, I would generate a pole in this combination of momentum, instead of momenta, instead of generating a pole near P1. 1, 0 or P2, 0 independently. I would actually, this would contribute to a pole near uh, P1 plus or minus, I don't care about the sign here, plus or minus P2, 0. Hmm? So if you believe this very rough uh, uh, argument here, then as far as the single momentum uh, uh, poles are concerned, I can exchange the order of these two limits going near the pole or making the states narrow and actually do this. Go straight from this green function to 
I just look at the green functions, right? I can skip the, the step where I make big wave packets and then make the uh, wave packets narrow and go straight from here to there. Just look at this green function near its uh, uh, most singular point where every momentum is going towards the pole, right? And that will be equal to the S matrix times the full propagator. Doing that is the uh, LS, uh, LSC reduction formula, which I have written in its full uh, form here. So the only difference from what, uh, what I, sh I have shown before is now I'm using the right convention for the incoming states. So I have these uh, all these uh, with the right signs, so I don't have to have these awkward signs here. Right, and I colored, I, I, and also I have n to m states, right? No, 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 no two to n, or, or in fact, I did n to two states, right? And, and so this is uh, in full generality now, and it is a very important uh, formula, right? It tells us how to get S matrix uh, elements from uh, green functions, right? I just do, I take this green function, right? Take the Fourier transform, look at its most singular uh, uh, terms, right? Look at the residue when I take every moment near the pole, right? And that will be full propagators times the S matrix. So if I multiply the result by the inverse, of the full propagators, I get just the S matrix. Right? This is a very, uh, very useful formula and tells us how to get from green functions to S matrix elements. Again, the important thing here is these masses that have shown up in the LSZ reduction formula are again not re directly related in any obvious way to parameters in the Lagrangian. Right? Again, these masses are all coming from that completeness relations uh, um, of the spectra of the theory. So there's physical masses of resonances and, and fundamental particles, right, and bound states and so on. Uh, and you get again this square root of z here, which is the field renormalization constant again, right? And once more, I could play the game of redefining my field. Right? I could just make up a new field, uh, phi prime, which is phi over square root of z. And you see that if I do this here, I'll have one factor of square root of z for each of these fields, which will conceal exactly these factors right here. Right? That is not to say, and be careful about this, that is not to say that these can be completely ignored because I can do these uh, redefinition and, and make them go away. Right? That's, that's not true because when I, you do this redefinition in the Lagrangian, you see that also you have factors of square root of z appearing, for instance, close to the coupling constants. And we'll see the effect of that in the near future. Right? But it does tell us that Again, you can define fields that behave asymptotically with the same full propagate. The, the full propagators of these phi prime fields look like the free theory propagators, right? Without the square root of z, so they have the same residue of the full propagators from the free theory. But the pole has moved from something that was equal to the mass parameter in the Lagrangian to this new physical mass and we have to see how to do that move, right? And this fulfills uh, uh, one promise that I, I made many times when I, I was doing the quantum field theory one uh, videos, which was that eventually I would prove the LSZ reduction formula. This is not the full-fledged proof that I, I did uh, I, uh, that argument about uh, exchanging the limits very in a very sketchy way, right? But in any case, it's good enough for our uses, right? So uh, that's it for for this video. Thank you.